Welcome to this brief video on language issues concerning traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM. I will argue that in general discussion, Chinese terminology should be used more extensively in TCM, particularly with respect to the organs, etiology, and herbs and formulas. Although herb and formula names are now often identified in Chinese, English terms such as spleen qi deficiency, instead of the original Chinese term, pi qi shu, create credibility problems before a scientific audience that is often unwilling to look at a historical or metaphorical explanation. In part one, I looked at fatigue from the point of view of TCM. I mentioned that certain signs and symptoms accompanying fatigue would indicate qi deficiency caused by the inadequate transformation of food into energy. I also said that case studies recorded by Chinese doctors provided significant supporting anecdotal evidence that certain herbal formulas could provide beneficial treatment. The problem with calling this syndrome spleen qi deficiency is that the spleen is not involved in the transformation of food into energy. As shown in part 2, the spleen is part of the body's lymphatic system that happens to be located near the digestive tract. It has vascular connections to both the pancreas and the stomach. However, the spleen is not directly involved in digestion. One reason why the notion of spleen qi deficiency is problematic can be seen with PubMed. PubMed is a resource supporting the search and retrieval of biomedical and life sciences literature. Searches on PubMed for articles on the spleen yield over 200,000 results. Searches on PubMed for articles on spleen qi yield over 1,000 results. The spleen qi articles refer to a proto-scientific concept of the organ, which differs from today's knowledge of the organ's physiology. On this basis, people can correctly argue that these are not scientific articles and that they should not appear in PubMed. The damage done to the TCM community is that the benefits of research into practices such as herbalism and acupuncture are then easily dismissed as being unscientific when their explanations may depend on other factors. The TCM explanation of spleen functionality is perhaps best defended by appreciating its metaphorical role in the Wu Xing or Five Transformations. I will expand further on this idea in a future video. Here I'm focusing on how we should be addressing TCM terminology. To discuss this further, I will consider three options. Translation, transliteration and correction. I will start with translation. The Chinese term for this syndrome is pi qi shu. Pi means spleen. Qi is usually left as qi. And shu translates as deficiency or vacuity. The term most commonly used is deficiency, and I don't believe there is much argument about the intuitive meaning of this notion or its translation. The word qi has many meanings, but it has now entered English vocabulary as a form of energy, and so equating fatigue to qi deficiency doesn't come as a surprise. However, the use of the word spleen is problematic for the reasons that I mentioned before. If we want to stay with an English translation, we have to differentiate between the TCM spleen and the anatomical spleen. Here, I will make a small detour to some more generalized issues concerning the use of translated TCM terms. I will refer to the introductory note on translation that can be found in the TCM books of Giovanni Machocha. Machocha states that Chinese medicine terms are essentially impossible to translate. I would not fully agree with that statement. Indeed, philosophical notions such as wuxing and yin-yang and words related to culture certainly can't be translated and require extensive explanation. Descriptions of certain sensations also defy translation. For example, the sensation shang qi can only be understood by reference to Chinese culture and medicine. Patients frequently report shang qi to an examining doctor and this will influence the diagnosis. A number of TCM terms diverge to a greater or lesser extent from our contemporary understanding in English. The TCM heart and spleen are viewed differently. Chinese notions of blood, phlegm and wind have a much more complex meaning, which would better be implied if left in the original Chinese. Translation can also be complicated by the fact that Chinese words can have multiple meanings depending on the context. A good example of this is Jing. The same Chinese character can mean either a channel or a woman's period. However, some items are basically referential. The knee or elbow is not mysterious in any language, and unambiguous translation is clearly possible. There is no question as to which organ the English word spleen or the Chinese word pi refers to. The problem lies in the explanation of its physiology. 
One way that is used to differentiate between the TCM spleen and the anatomical spleen is by capitalizing the TCM term. Although this highlights the differentiation, the word remains the same, and this highlighting is only noticeable in the written form. This advantage disappears in any spoken conversation a TCM practitioner may have with a patient or a lay person. As I mentioned before, qi is a common concept in TCM, and translating it as energy is inadequate. Spleen qi shu is in my opinion the worst of the translation options. It appears in over 7,000 Google searches. Another problem concerns the general style of translation, and this is most evident in the problem of translating the word xie qi into English. We're faced with translating the word either using the medieval idea of an evil entering the body, or in the modern sense of a pathogen. Both of these translations pose problems, opening up TCM to criticism. The modern scientific word for a pathogen in Chinese is pingyuan qi. Another aspect of the style issue presents itself when academics analyze TCM texts in a philological context. This can be seen in the important translations of Professor Unschuld. In the prolegomena to his valuable translation to the Huang Di Neijing, he states the following. A translation, in our view, is worth its name only if it strives to reproduce a text in a target language, as close to its original format and meaning as possible, without omissions and anachronistic interpretations and additions. While very worthy as a goal, his use of terms such as depots and palaces adds little to our understanding and doesn't help improve patient treatment, as can be seen in the text below. I'll pass now to my preferred option, that is, using Chinese terminology, especially with respect to organs, etiology and herbs and formulas. This poses a big challenge for the beginning student, but offers advantages once it is mastered. Machocha states, in my books, I've chosen to translate all Chinese medicine terms rather than using pinyin purely for reasons of style, as a sentence written half in English and half in pinyin is often awkward. For written communication, pinyin is today the official romanization system for standard Chinese in mainland China. This superseded the Wei Jiao system, which was commonly used up to the 1970s. Machocha gives the example of this sentence. To treat piyang shu... We adopt the zhe fa of bu pi and wen yang. In the first place, I don't think there will be any misunderstanding if we use the term treatment principle for zhe fa. Although the sentence looks challenging when we look at it in isolation, the remaining Chinese terms, bu, to tonify, and wen, to warm, are actually very commonly used, especially in the names of formulas. Discussion groups commonly appear to prefer referencing formulas by their Chinese names as does Machiocha in his books. Of course, the following sentence appears to make more sense, and is certainly more elegant. To treat spleen-yang deficiency, we adopt the treatment principle of tonifying the spleen and warming yang, but then we return to the problem of the spleen and its physiology. In reality, every specialty has its own language and commonly accepted jargon. Acquiring it may be more or less of a challenge, but it becomes a necessity for efficient and accurate communication. For example, microbiologists have their own language that obviously requires explanation to lay persons. In Argentine tango, another traditional activity, every tanguera and tanguero will understand the terms arrastre, voleo and cabeceo. In neither of these two cases are words translated into basic English equivalents. Why does TCM see this as a problem? Machocha later concedes the following. The problem arises only in the written form, as in my experience, most lecturers normally prefer pinyin terms. Indeed, when I myself lecture, I generally use the pinyin terms rather than the English translation. Unfortunately, it is the written form that lays TCM open to modern medical criticism. In part, I shouldn't be too severe in critiquing Machocha's approach, as his purpose is to facilitate the student's learning process. However, it creates a habit of ambiguous usage which ends up being detrimental to the community, and this is exacerbated by TCM information that's easy to digest and criticize, ending up on the internet. Later, Machiocha states, I therefore think that the future of teaching Chinese medicine lies not in trying to impose the straitjacket of a rigid terminology of the rich ideas of Chinese medicine, but in teaching students more and more Chinese characters, explaining the richness of meaning associated with them in the context of Chinese medicine. 
Students of TCM, if they're serious, will need to make the jump to Chinese terminology. In fact, if they're serious, they should be encouraged to travel to China, if circumstances permit, to study and follow doctors for as long as they can. In that case, the student will certainly need to know her or his Chinese terminology, as most doctors in China don't speak English. If a patient requires an explanation, a translation can be offered with some historic background. In general, the patient wants to get better, and that is what the practitioner should focus on. The final option, although technically valid, defeats the whole notion of traditional Chinese medicine, in that it takes away the linkage between TCM diagnosis and its remedies. It does not help us to use the tools of TCM to treat a patient with herbs or acupuncture. In conclusion, this is a summary of the reasons for more extensive use of Chinese terms when discussing traditional Chinese medicine. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you'll join me for future videos in this series.